Well, good morning, and what a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Today we'll be looking at our study in the book of Psalms, and we'll be focusing on Psalm 132 today. When we look at the book of Psalms, as we've mentioned before, it is not like any other book in the entire Bible. When we look at Genesis, Exodus, Ephesians, Colossians, these are all books that God wrote to man for instruction, for reproof, for correction, and doctrine. Not that we don't have that in the book of Psalms, correction, reproof, doctrine, but there is a flip side to who is doing the writings. When we look at the book of Psalms, it is man writing to God. God, this is what I'm going through. God, this is what I'm feeling. This is what it feels like in my situation. So we kind of have a reverse in that aspect. The book of Psalms was written, compiled by three different editors over a period of time. The main one being David, and of course there are five books to the book of Psalms. When you'll see them divided as book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five. They correspond with the first five books of the Bible, or the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I will slow down here in a little bit, but I'm just trying to get us caught up because we're already losing time. But when we look at Psalm 132, can anyone tell me what collection of Psalms is this part of? Songs of Ascent, Songs of Degree, whatever you want, not whatever you want to call them, but yeah. whichever one you have a preference towards. So the Song of Ascent, Song of Degrees, who can tell me what is the purpose of the Songs of Ascent or the Songs of Degrees? Why were they compiled in the way that they were? They were in correspondence with the Well, not the Songs of Degrees. The thing that's important about the Songs of Degrees is, can you remember the reason why the Songs of Degrees? The yes, they were sang as they came up to the temple. And when we look at the Songs of Degrees, they were, as the pilgrims sang them on their journey to the temple, and or possibly as they entered into the temple, because I think there's um, 13. There's 15 Psalms, so there's 15 steps leading up in the temple, so almost each step when they reached, they would sing each song. When we look at the book of Psalms as a whole, we know that it was compiled because it is a Jewish song book. It, we don't want to sing the same song over and over and over. We have too many other emotions and feelings to express. We can sing the song Amen over again and get excited, but there's other songs we like to sing too because there's times when we feel, God, I want more of you, and we sing as the deer pants for the water, and so on and so on. So let's look at Psalm 134. Psalm 1, I'm sorry, Psalm 132. Psalm 132 is where we're going to today. Spurgeon said in the Psalms of David, in regards to Psalm 132, let us note the ascent of this psalm of degrees. We heard, we found, we will go, we will worship. And for Psalm 132 and verse 1, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. When we look at Psalm 132 and we start getting down to the nitty gritty, this is the 13th Psalm of Ascent. We only have two more to go in the Psalms of Ascent to cover in this series. We will probably cover a few more Psalms after that, but not a whole lot more before we move on to our next um, Sunday School series. But it contains 18 verses, which is a big change from last week. Last week, there were only three verses. And we also talked about how last week it was a prequel to a lament. Oh, it is, this Psalm 132 is classed as a royal psalm and a psalm of Zion. 
So it's a song about royalty, it's a song about David, and it's a song about Zion. Now, if you read Psalm 132, which I'll go ahead and read that as is the fashion. Psalm 132. Where the Bible reads, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up, go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the middle, in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacle. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into the rest, into thy rest. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. And let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne, and thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, that I shall teach them. Their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. There will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. So, I know there's a lot here. We're going to back up and do like we do every week. What is the main verse? What do you think is the key verse of this passage? Or key verses? What is that one verse or verses that summarize this passage in a nutshell? One and ten, brother. You want to go ahead and read those? Lord, remember, Lord, remember David in all his afflictions. For thy servant David's sake, turn out away the face of thine anointed. And turn out away the face of thy anointed. When we look at this psalm, we're talking about David and his afflictions, and we're also talking about God's response to David. How is he dealing with David? What has he promised him? We look at the Davidic comment covenant, how God promised and made an oath to David. So we're dealing with David's afflictions as a song, but we're also dealing with God's promises to David. Does anybody else have any other verse or verses that they want to add to this list? I think number nine is pretty good too. Number nine, go ahead and throw it out there, brother. Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness. Let thy priest be and, clothed and thy saints. with righteousness and thy saints. Shout for joy. And they shall shout for joy. Anyone else want to add anything to the list? 16 kind of goes with this list. He likes that. Okay, you want to go ahead? I will also close their priest for salvation. Our saints shall shout a lot for joy. Absolutely. Now, what about key phrases? Are there any key phrases that jump out? of this passage actually that was summarized Psalm 132 in a nutshell.
I threw out there, I thought you were going to go right after it in the very beginning where it says, remember David. Because, and that's one of that I threw down because that's what we're doing throughout the entire Psalm 132 is, is remembering David. He's remembering the promises that God gave him. And also I threw in there chosen Zion because we're dealing with the habitation of where God's dwelling. Because it's not just a matter of remembering David's afflictions, but it's remembering that they, the promise that David and his children can dwell in Zion with God, that they can dwell in his habitation, they can work at his, uh, worship at his footstool. If they obey the covenant and they do not break it. Anybody else have any other phrases they want to add to before we talk about key words, single words that describe and summarize Psalm 132? So are there any last key phrases before we move on? If not, let's jump into what are some key words, or and when I say words, just single words that summarize Psalm 132, excuse me, in a nutshell. Covenant. Covenant. Salvation. Salvation. For me, I have to come back to that word remember, because that's exactly what this whole psalm is about, is they are remembering what David went through and what God promised him. Anything else? Well, David himself. David himself, because that's who we're discussing. That's who the psalm is about. And the last one I have down for myself would be sworn because he made an oath and we're talking about the covenant that God made with David himself. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to move on and transition. It does not appear that Psalm 132 was quoted anywhere in the New Testament. I could not discover a poetic style to really throw it out there. The history of the psalm could go in either direction. Some believe that it was a psalm that was written to commemorate King David, and it was sang year after year in lieu of his reign as a celebration. Now, when it comes down to the divisions of the psalm itself, Spurgeon broke it down into three divisions. Verses 1 through 7, a statement of David's anxious care to build the house. Verses 8 through 10, a prayer at the removal of the ark. And verses 11 through 18, a pleading of the divine covenant and its promises. Someone else also made the statement that this could be broken into two different sections. David's oath to God, verses 1 through 10, and God's oath to David, verses 11 through 18. Now let me back up for one quick moment. Because whenever we look at the Word of God, there's one individual that can be seen throughout every single passage of the Bible, and that is Jesus Christ. And how is Jesus Christ portrayed in this passage according to Keith L. Brooks? Peter applies this to Christ and tells us that David himself so understood it, and he refers to Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. Christ fulfilled all the conditions, and the Father was given to him. The Father has given him the throne of his father David, according to Luke chapter 1 and verse 32. He is now at the right hand of the Father's throne, and when the fullness of the Gentiles is gathered in, the promise of the Davidic throne will be made good, and he will come to reign over all. The saints shall sit with him upon his eternal throne. And he references Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Now, when we start diving into the psalm itself, and starting at verse 1, when I get my Bible right side up, the Bible states, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. Now, first of all, one thing that should jump out at us is that word, Lord. And why is that? It's all caps. And what do we know about the word Lord, all caps, in the King James Version of the Bible? It's everything that we need God to be. It's not just one thing in this situation, because sometimes we need Him to be our peace. Sometimes we need Him to be our healer. 
But what God is saying when we're looking at this is, it doesn't matter when it came to David. I was everything he ever needed. I was all-encompassing. And he says, remember David in all his afflictions. So God is remembering, and they are remembering everything that David went through. David didn't always have an easy life. He really did. I don't know what his home life was like, but we know that he had several brothers. And when it comes to brothers, they're not always the easiest on each other. We also know that David was the one out hurting, out taking care of Jesse, Jesse's sheep. Typically in our culture, the oldest would be the most responsible. But David, the youngest, was out hurting the sheep. Why? I couldn't tell you. Maybe that was the culture. Maybe that was the nature. Maybe David just got the short straw on the stick that day. And he got the, the eternal job of stop watching the sheep. Ever find that out in life? If somebody at work finds out that you do something good, especially a boss, it doesn't matter if everybody else can do it. You are per uh, perpetually assigned to that task. And if somebody else does it and they mess up, guess who's getting yelled at? It's not them. It's going to be you. You take this and you fix it. They don't even get involved in the correction process of the comes to mistakes. You just take care of it. But David was taking care of the sheep. And there comes the man of God. And what does the man of God do? He anoints him with oil. Brother, is there already a king over Israel? Yep. What happens when somebody does something like this, typically? Big old bulls, I guess, put on their mark because they know that they are next in line. If something happens to me, they take the throne. And who's to say that they're not going to do it by accident, quote unquote? You know, it places a target, and David now becomes a target because he is the anointed man of God. And being the anointed man of God is not always an easy task because it places a bullseye on. And the same thing is true in today's society. Sometimes ministers get jealous of other people's anointing and the way that God is using them. You know, same thing is true in our own lives. Uh, with us being Christians, we can get bullseyes placed on us. And we can get afflictions placed on us that has nothing to do with our, react, our actions and our, or I should say, anything that had to do with our doing in the first place. Only because we're Christians. David and his afflictions. Why his afflictions? The list could probably go on and on and on. He was God's man. But at the time, Saul was still reigning. So what did David go through? He was best friends with the king, but there came a time where he lost his best friend. He had to flee for his life. He had to go down into the enemy's camp and live there. After defeat, defeating Goliath, he runs to his wife down to Gath, if I remember correctly. He runs into the Philistines' stronghold, and there he tries to find refuge. And then the king started wondering what David was doing there, so now he not only has Saul chasing him, but now he has the Philistine king wondering what's going on, and raising questions, and wondering what he's going to do to him. So he acts mad and flees. And then he hides in a cave. And not only is that not up, he's there with, what, 600 men? But what do we see David doing in this time in the middle of all his afflictions? God's blessing him. And this band of vagabonds that really weren't good for anything, David organizes them into a great militia. You know, just because people come against the man of God, the children of God, that doesn't mean that God's not going to take care of them. It also doesn't mean that there's not more afflictions to come, but where does our faith and our trust lie? Now, regardless of the afflictions we go through, sometimes the afflictions come upon us for our purifying process as well, but how are we responding to those situations? Do we realize that God is everything we need in that situation and more? Lord, remember David. You know, if only we would realize that it doesn't matter what life throws our way, God has remembered us, and he has not forgotten us. Joseph was in Pharaoh's prison, and he was there for not just a short while, but he was there for a long while. The scripture goes on to say, but God remembered Joseph. Now, God never forgets his children. He's always there with us. 
even in the middle of our affliction, God is with us every step of the way, just as he was with David and all the mighty men of old. But in the middle of his, his affliction, we are all, they're also crying out for God to remember. Let me just see where I want to go with this time. The desires that, that David had himself. What was one of the chief desires that David had? What was the one thing he wanted to do? No, oh, exactly. Exactly. He wanted to build a temple. And why did he want to build the temple? He wanted to build a permanent habitation for God. See, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God, they took God with them. We always say about don't put God in a box, but God put himself in a box for the Israelites. And they carried that box around everywhere they went. And I'm referring to the Ark of the Covenant. And God dwelt with them. And his cloud was over the tent. And here we are remembering how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into thy tabernacle of thy house, nor go into the bed. I will not give sleep to my eyelids or slumber to my eyelids. Uh, sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. David wanted to make a permanent place for God. It wasn't a matter of, okay, God is always on the move now, but we are permanent, we are finally settled, and we want God to be settled with us in our midst. But there was a problem at the beginning of David's reign when he desired to build the house of God. And there was a big problem. You know what that problem was? I know where you're coming from. I'm going a little bit farther. This is why I shouldn't dig for and pull for specific answers. Remember that box we talked about that God put himself in? The Ark of the Covenant? It wasn't in Israel. Because what happened was man got careless with the things of God. The things of God that should have been so special, they became commonplace. They were no different than the furniture in your own house. And the enemy came in. And what did they decide? Well, we're going to pull out our Hail Mary, our magic cure-all. It's even better than vinegar. And we're going to send it off to battle. Because we know that the, the army that carries the ark is unstoppable. And Hophni and Phineas, the sons of Eli the priest, take that ark into battle. But God does not honor them on that occasion. And the Philistines kill Hophni, they kill Phineas. And Phineas' wife gives birth, and we know that the Ichabod is born, and the glory of the Lord is departed, and the Philistines take the ark. And the Philistines discover that the Ark of the Covenant is not like any other piece of furniture in their temples, and that the God of Jehovah is not like any of their other gods, because God proved himself supreme on every occasion. Basically, what they did was they took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of Dagon to worship it alongside Dagon. Who is Dagon? To put it in our minds' eyes, Dagon is Poseidon. And that is exactly who it is. It is Poseidon. Images never change. Names change over time, but it is Poseidon. That demon showed himself in that form. That's how they documented it. Dagon is Poseidon. And what happened was, on day one, God knocks beside him on his face. Day two, he cuts off the hands, and if I remember correctly, the head. Day three, he finally has it up and cuts him off at the waist. And, the, and all of a sudden, everybody in that um, city or that village gets sick with emeralds, and they kick God out of that city because they don't want any more affliction to come to them. So they take it to a house by the name of 
Abinadab. And we find that in 2 Samuel 6, 4. 2 Samuel 6, 4. I'm going to pass over scripture for the time being because I am running out of time. But you can have the notes, you can always look them up. And there it well. But then we get on to verse number 5, if I remember correctly. No, verse 6. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. So what is the significance of we found it at Ephrata? What do we know of Ephrata? What is the significance of Ephrata? David. David was born there. It was the house of David. We know that because of prophecy of Micah chapter 2, and I think it's verse 5, it's uh, Bethlehem of Ephrata, how uh, that were small among the nations. We know that in uh, the genealogies, we know that in the Christmas account, because they had to go back to Bethlehem. So what does this tell us? That while David was still in his homeland, before he was kicked out, before he was on the move, he was already thinking of it. How I wish and I long for to be able to worship before the throne of God. How I long to be in the presence of God. Is that the desire of our heart? That every week, Lord, I cannot wait to go to church. Lord, I cannot wait to get into my prayer closet. Lord, I cannot wait to just bask in your presence. Maybe we're off uh, taking care of errands. Maybe we're at our workplace. Lord, I cannot wait till I can spend time with you today. And I'm not talking just little, um, a small bit of time. Because we can pray as we work and focus on things like that. But there is something. There is something special when you can guess, aside from the world, where you can push everything aside, where it seems like no one else exists, and you can just pray. And I don't mean pray, Lord Lady guys. I mean just flat out pray. Get into the presence of God, worship Him in sincerity and truth. Brother Eli was mentioning this morning how the priests were to be robed with salvation. We know that they were to put on white robes. White robes is salvation. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we are kings and priests of God. Oh, when we can make sure that we are clean, when we are holy, we've been living right, and we have not put on the garments of the flesh that have been spotted and tattered and torn, but we've been doing our best to live right. We've been diving into the Holy Scripture. We've been seeing things in the Bible where God's been dealing with us through the power of the Holy Ghost, saying, you need to change this, and you've been saying, yes, Lord, I want to change that. Lord, I want to be perfect and righteous in your sight. I don't want anything to be between Betwixt me and thee, but Lord, clean me and make me pure and keep me holy. And when we know we've been doing like that, we don't have to come to the presence of God. God, I don't know if I messed up today. I know I've been living right. God, I don't know if I've done this or done that. But we know that I have a shadow of doubt that we are pure. We are holy. We are righteous priests of God that if we had to go and enter into the holy of holies as we're about to in worship, we know who are not like the old high priest of old that we they might fall on their face dead if they were not holy, but we know we've been clean. We know we've been holy and we've been living right. And when we do that, we can say, God, oh, I long to be in thy presence. How I long for you to come down and dwell in my presence in my presence and change me, Lord, and that I may feel you, that I may sense you, that I may commune with you, because it's not just a feeling, it is that communion, communing with God where we talk to God, and God talks back with us, and we know His voice, because the Bible says that His sheep know His voice. Oh God, I've been dreaming and thinking about this all day long. I can finally push away the care of this world, and I can get alone with you. Oh, may that be the desires of our hearts to be clean, to be righteous, to be holy, to enter into the holy place of God, whether it be in with God's people, where we know where two or three are gathered in God's name, He comes down in a mighty, mighty way, or whether it's between us and God, and He comes down and moves in our prayer time like never before, and He just comes down and He talks, and He changes us, and He changes our outcome and our situation. And he talks to us in such a manner that we know that it's not our voice. Amen. 
We know it's not the devil's voice. He's not coming in like an angel, like but the presence of God is so strong that the devil wouldn't even dare set foot within a mile radius of where we're at. Because we've been keeping ourselves clean and we've been longing all day from the very beginning as long as we can remember. God, I want to dwell in your presence and worship you in sincerity and in holiness as never before. He heard about it. He longed for it. Long before perhaps he would ever anoint a king. He just thought about how I would long to be in the presence of God. To worship before the ark. But the ark was moved. But there came a day when David said, I'm going to take back what they took from us. Now moving on to verses 6 and 7. Lo, we heard of it at Ephraim. We found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacle and we will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, and thou, in the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and thy saints shout for joy. Because when we are clothed with righteousness, we can shout at the coming of the Lord. For thy servants, David, say, turn not away thy face of thy anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn about it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throat. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Here God makes a statement that if his children will keep his covenant, they will sit upon the throne. And I'm going to quickly go on because there's one last thing I want to talk about. But God promised David that his throne would never end. And when God makes a promise, that's all there is to it. But the other condition was that if his children obeyed, they would sit on it. God never said that his throne would end. He just said, I'm not going to let them sit on your throne. And we do find that throughout the history of Israel. There comes a point where the kingdom is divided. And God says, enough is enough. You don't want to listen to me. You want to worship your own idols. You want to have a heyday with them then you know what? I'm done bringing the Babylons upon you. The Babylonians. And they go into captivity. Does the throne of David ever end while they're in captivity? No. There may be nobody occupying the throne of David. Not of his seed, but the, his throne never ended. There was always an heir. And they may not have been allowed to sit on, but there came a time when God restored it. And then going down a little bit farther, and we know there's coming a time when God will restore it, when Jesus comes back and sits upon it. But going down a little bit farther, and just wrapping up with this. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, he will I dwell. For I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her holy bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for my anointing. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown of glory. Here we have God speaking, and he says, you know what? I have chosen Zion. I have chosen that holy hill as my habitation. This is where Jerusalem sits. And I will have my house built up here because I desire. Does God think that this is the perfect position for him to dwell in the entire universe? No. This, the reason God wants to dwell there is that's because that's where his people are. He desires to be in the midst of his people. And we read in the book of Psalms, chapter 113, verses 5 and 6, God has to humble himself just to dwell in heaven. We are all happy and go lucky when we sing about heaven and how we want to be there and how we want to look upon his face when we get there. And streets of gold and gates of pearl. But God has to humble himself to dwell there. But God dwells there because that's where he chose to dwell with his people forever. Why does God desire to dwell inside, earthly side, with David? Because that's where his people are. And he desires to be in the midst of his people. And where the presence of God is, 
There is blessing upon his people. The poor shall never beg for bread. The priest shall experience robes of salvation, not their own righteousness, but God will give them whole new garments. He will bless his people, and he will curse their enemies. Why? Because God is dwelling in the midst of a people that love him. And that was his desire. You know, where the, we're in the presence of God, things change. Things change. There is blessing in the presence of God. There isn't always a change in our situation. When we come up from the altar, maybe that situation is still there, whether we put it there or somebody else did. But that doesn't mean we didn't get a blessing from God. It doesn't mean we didn't get encouragement from God. It doesn't mean we didn't get a word from God. A word that you claim on that will take us through. Whether it be, he said in his word that he will never leave us or forsake us. Maybe it's a personal word that God has given to you. Maybe there's a financial struggle. I remember coming home one um, night from work in October several years ago. And God said, don't worry about your finances. Now, my finances were fine at the time. I didn't have anything to worry about. But then January struck. <laughs> and that was a month I balanced my checkbook. It came out perfect. I shut it up quick and I put it back in the drawer and I didn't ask any questions because it should not come out perfect. But what was that? That was me. God gave me that word way back when. And I clung to that word. Throughout that month, I knew that checkbook should not be out perfect or how it would be how no money come out of the finances. But God gave me a word. No. Did God give you a word? No. He may not always change the situation, but there is a blessing in the presence of God. And in the end, it may, the outcome may not be what we thought it should be, but it will come out better than we ever thought it could be if we just leave it in the hands of God. Okay, I'm out of time. Any thoughts, any questions? If not... Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high, but there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, making himself his voice that he so chooses. We pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today. And anoint our hearts and our minds to receive the word which you have for us today, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would apply it to our lives, Lord, and that we would be transformed even farther into the very image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, thank you.